welcome to our session, uh, Fit for Future, Driving Innovation Health System Governance, Financing and Resilience. I'm really glad uh, that we were able um, to kick off in a way uh, this year's health forum. And we really want to build bridges, build bridges between um, the past, the future, build bridge, building a bridge between evidence and policy, and also on the difference between the different levels um, of um, in policy work. So on the regional level, um, the national level, but in particular also the European level, and then bringing all those levels together. It would have been wonderful um, to see you uh, if it would have been possible to see you in person. Um, but again, here we are. Um, we are used to that, obviously, uh, but uh, still, uh, we nevertheless are very much looking forward to seeing you next year in Gastein. I, for the time being, let me assure you, it was really bad weather yesterday evening, um, and it will be wonderful weather next year, um, that's for sure. Thank you um, to the Gastein Forum for being able to um, flexible um, adjust to the to the to the um, epidemiological situation and to be able that we can meet again um, for another um, health forum. Thank you um, all the team that made that possible and in particular for our session I want to thank uh, Dimitra Pantelli from the European Observatory who will be our moderator today and her team in particular also um, Brian Thiele and particular big thank you uh, to all our panelists who will um, share their experiences and then particularly also share their thoughts um, on um, the points that are important to be able to be fit for the future. In that way, Dimitri, the floor is yours and I wish you all a wonderful session. Thank you very much, Stefan. Good morning, everyone, also from me, from Brussels, from the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. Thank you for joining us on a Monday morning um, to kick off this year's uh, European Health Forum Gestein. Um, you have joined our session, which, as Stefan already mentioned, is on driving innovation in health system governance, financing and resilience. And I think all of us uh, know and understand that health systems need to change and adapt to the changing needs of health of, and the population. We've understood that really well uh, during the last pandemic. And innovation, which is at the core, uh, a core of our session today, holds the key to this possible uh, change. However, uh, if we don't implement this innovation right and in a way that actually is moving our health systems forward, we cannot really harness its uh, potential. Uh, when we think about how we uh, have fared during the pandemic so far, the importance of primary healthcare in particular uh, becomes very clear. So today we will focus on innovation in health systems in general, but also particularly on primary healthcare. Um, and perhaps I should mention at this point that um, this is the, the second round of discussions at the international level um, on this general topic. Earlier this month, we gathered in a hybrid event, some of us in Vienna, some of you perhaps um, online, to discuss um, this issue of implementing innovation in primary healthcare, of how we can actually practically change our health systems by introducing new solutions um, that will bring them forward and advance them. Um, and we had a very lively discussions with the Minister of Health uh, of Austria, with the Minister of Health of Slovenia, uh, with the Commission's Director General for Structural Reform Support and the European Investment Bank, um, trying to understand exactly what the options are that are available to European countries to transform their health systems moving forward. Uh, we concluded back um, on the 9th of September, and we will build on those lessons today, that there are a number of core uh, values that we need to take forward with us. Perhaps first and foremost and most intuitive, the adequate and sustained funding for innovation and for health systems as a whole, but also stakeholder involvement in understanding which innovations we need and how we can implement them, and also learning from each other and working together. So these were the main, uh, let's say, takeaways from our discussion so far. And today uh, we're meeting here at the European Health Forum Gastein the theme of this year is transformative change to do the health systems of the future in the wake of the pandemic. And this is how we want to, to structure and steer uh, today's discussion based on our, on our previous insights. Understand better from countries that have recently implemented comprehensive, important reforms in primary healthcare, how that has happened, how that has um, interacted with the COVID-19 pandemic and most importantly what tangible lessons we can take with us for the future um, in order to be able to have stronger health systems 
and uh, address our existing, but also potential new challenges, um, be prepared and be resilient. To do this, we have with us five esteemed colleagues uh, who will help us. Stefan Eichfalder from the Austrian Ministry of Health, you already met. Uh, we also have Ilana Ventura from the Austrian Ministry of Health. Ilana will tell us about the components of the comprehensive primary healthcare reform in Austria um, and how, uh, particularly Ilana, I think how stakeholders are involved into bringing this reform further and further uh, policing it. We have Vesna Petric from the Ministry of Health in Slovenia who will highlight initiatives from the Slovenian side on strengthening primary care and particularly focus on mental health. I think that's not very important that you talk to us about that. We have Thomas Buck from the region of Flanders um, in Belgium, uh, where also a very innovative approach to integrated primary health care was implemented right in time to tackle the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. And Thomas will be uh, talking to us about that. And we also have Christoph Schietz from the uh, Commission's Directorate on Structural Reform Support, uh, DG Reform, who will bring uh, in the European perspective and the experience of working with member states and how we can make that even stronger, even more um, in the years to come. So we have structured the session as follows. We will first hear from our participating countries, um, as I mentioned, their testimonials on how their primary healthcare reforms uh, have worked so far and how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected implementation, but also um, how it has helped understand where the strengths lie. Then we will hear uh, the European perspective, and then we will move into a larger uh, panel discussion, broader panel discussion on distilling the lessons from all these activities that have taken place in recent years and during the pandemic and understand and discuss among ourselves how we can harness them practically, tangibly, uh, to have avenues for action in the next few years uh, to make our systems fit for the future. Um, for you and for your interaction with us, which we value very much, as you know from every year at the European Health Forum Gastein, uh, there are two avenues. You will see on the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A function and a chat function. So what we ask you to do is to put any direct questions that you have to our speakers or to the panel as a whole in the Q&A box. If you have your own experience that you want to bring in or general comments on the session, please use the chat box. So try to keep those divided as much as possible. And we have my uh, colleague Florian Tille from the European Observatory who is here today with us and will be keeping an eye on the Q&A and the chat box and whom I will bring in um, periodically during the session to let us know what you all uh, have been talking about and what you would like the panel to address. Um, I think uh, this is it. Without further ado, uh, I would like to um, hand the floor to Ilana Ventura from the Austrian Ministry of Health to talk to us about the Austrian experience with primary healthcare reform in recent years. Ilana, over to you. Thank you, Timmy. And I'm really happy that uh, I can share with you now very quickly though, um, the Austrian experience when it comes to primary health care. And I will start in the first slide with a very short overview of the most important reform steps. So um, we can start actually with the next slide. And uh, you can see here that the Austrian health care reform started in 2012-13 um, with the involvement of all major stakeholders. Um, and here, uh, the enhancement of primary health care was already uh, defined as a strategic target. A year later, we had a very comprehensive uh, concept outlining already a new structure of team-based cooperation uh, in the primary health care setting. So um, I will explain you in a minute what we mean with this new structure. And um, in addition to that, um, you can see that along the way, we had to uh, think about legislative amendments, for example, the primary health care bill in 2017. And uh, that is not directly linked to the health care reform, but uh, I believe a direct outcome of it. You can see in red here um, our two initiatives or projects that we started in cooperation with the European Commission. And that one, uh, the first one in 2018 and the second one actually this year. And I will come to that in a minute as well. But let's get to the next slide where I can show you uh, what we are talking about when we talk about the new structures um, of primary health care. So next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, when we talk about the new structures of team-based primary health care, we talk about primary health care units that can be either established in the form of 
centers or networks. And um, you can see here that we have a balance between flexibility and um, um, like set uh, settings that, that need to be respected. So every uh, unit has a core team that is the same for every unit in Austria with general practitioners, qualified nurses, uh, or qualified nurse and uh, practice assistants. And then um, in regards to the regional requirements, uh, there is an extended team and that can consist of different uh, types of uh, healthcare workers, again, uh, in a flexible mode um, in, in regards to the regional uh, provision uh, requirements. So you see, we are really focusing on multi-professional uh, cooperation. Um, due to the team-based stru structure, there is um, the possibility of extended opening hours, and there's a wide range of services that are offered. At the moment, we have 28 primary healthcare units in Austria. Uh, we were hoping for more, but also due to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, and not only because of that, but also um, the development slowed down a bit and we have been really eager to, to bring more speed into the development of primary healthcare units. Uh, in the next slide, uh, you see our cooperation with the first cooperation with the European Commission that we're very thankful of uh, in the framework of the technical service instrument. Um, and that I the idea of cooperation was born out of the uh, thought that um, many physicians and uh, medical students actually lack certain uh, knowledge and know-how in regards to how to found uh, their private practice. So we really wanted to offer a comprehensive package of measures to support them. And uh, we produced here a startup guide with uh, essential questions for founding primary healthcare units in regards to economical questions, organizational structure questions, infrastructure, and so on. And also on the website that you see here, you can find all this information. In addition, uh, there are a num uh, number of templates, starting from business concepts, uh, financial plans, um, contracts, uh, employment contracts, everything that can support uh, the founders of these units uh, when they start uh, building their business. In addition, uh, in the part of the startup services is also uh, on-site support. So we were able to offer 29 consultations so far for 18 primary healthcare units in Austria, where really uh, experts are going to the units and, and answering their questions in regards to founding their, their practice. And last but not least, uh, we also thought about the communication strategy in order to really um, target our target groups or, that we want to reach, which are medical students, uh, young physicians, and, and other healthcare workers. So uh, that is the, the cooperation we have with the European Commission until uh, the end of this year. And in the next slide, you see our new uh, cooperation, which we are really proud of um, um, within the framework of the Recovery and Resilience Facility, because we were able to really earmark 100 million euro for strengthening primary health care in Austria for the next few years. And um, you can see that we have divided the project into two, two different uh, focus areas with multi-level set of measures. So the first area of our project is really to, with the goal to um, make primary healthcare in general more attractive in Austria. And one very central measure here is to uh, develop and, and uh, further develop a platform for primary healthcare, where the focus is on knowledge, knowledge exchange and, and um, communication and networking between the stakeholders and the primary healthcare community, but also um, with the goal of really building a hub for new ideas and project developments, where thoughts and ideas can really uh, develop and, and um, people will be supported. The other part of the um, project is a funding part, where we on the one hand want to fund uh, at least 16 new primary healthcare centers and networks in Austria, where we will fund up to 50% of the investment costs. And the other funding part is um, to fund uh, innovative primary healthcare projects uh, with the focus on ecological sustainability, social inclusion, infrastructure, and education. And why are we doing that? Because we really want to support and facilitate uh, the funding and establishment of further primary healthcare units in Austria. We really want to improve the interdisciplinary cooperation between the different healthcare workers. We believe that you need to promote innovation and knowledge exchange in the area. 
And also, as I mentioned before, this networking and, and uh, communication idea between uh, healthcare workers, professionals, and other stakeholders. In the next slide, um, as a final thought, you can see that we always, along the way, we were thinking, how do we really get from theory to practical implementation? And here are a few thoughts about that. Well, first of all, you really need a strategic outline for your measures and your ideas and projects, but also for the vision. You need to manifest a common understanding between the different stakeholders. So everyone needs to understand that what we are really talking about is the same thing and that we have more or less the same goals uh, along the way. Uh, you might need to think about legislative amendments as, as we had to do that uh, um, in our process. Then I believe that this, um, this balance between flexibility and clear standards is really central because also within Austria, no one size fits all. And last but not least, and mostly important, is uh, the backing by political will and ownership. Because if you don't have that, then you, don't, you cannot guarantee that you have a long lasting and sustainable impact with your measures. In the last slide, I uh, finally put you some links uh, if you're interested to learn more about the Austrian experience in regards with uh, the cooperation with the European Commission. Most of, the, is, most of it is in German, but there are two links in English, and I believe that our colleagues from Gastein are going to add these links in the chat function so you can look at them, uh, explaining a bit about the startup initiative and also about our startup guide. And we also have a new website uh, in, uh, within this new cooperation uh, that I mentioned before, but that's unfortunately in German, so I hope that you will still find it interesting. Thank you very much, and I hope I'm in time and didn't speak too long. <laughs> You are great. Thank you very much, um, Ilana. I can only recommend the, the links um, in English. They are very informative and th they are very concise. So I think, um, and a lot, of, a lot of insights also for countries outside Austria. Uh, Ilana, so from my side, uh, congratulations also to your team for putting this together. I, before going to Vesna, what I really uh, want to point out um, about Ilana's presentation, other than the final more or less crash course on the important components of implementing innovation, um, is this highlighting of the different types of support uh, that, for example, the European uh, Commission can provide. Uh, so you showed us um, that, for instance, through the uh, technical support instrument, the TSI, you were able to create the startup guide. Um, so it's not just financial support for infrastructures, for building new primary healthcare units, but also for different types of needs uh, to implement innovation moving forward. And the other point that I would like to come back uh, to later in our discussion is this uh, idea of the incubator where we try to understand how innovation can come from within the system. And that then probably links to a better implementation um, as well. So thank you very much, Lana, uh, for the perspective from Austria and for these really, really important insights. We move uh, to Slovenia, uh, the country uh, that currently has the presidency of the European Council. Vesna, thank you very much for joining us today. Your uh, presidency priorities include both innovation and collaboration uh, among, among countries. Uh, I think uh, very, very important points, both of them. Tell us uh, about um, reforms in recent years and initiatives in recent years in Slovenia, particularly um, your experience when it comes to primary health care. Vesna, over to you. Amy, yes, thank you very much for giving us opportunity um, uh, uh, to talk at this session also. Uh, I would uh, ask um, the slide uh, that is presented now uh, is not the first one, but I can, I can change and start talking from here. <laughs> it's not so important, uh, but um, it's, um, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the case that in Slovenia already since 2008, when we uh, uh, were uh, approaching the crisis and during the crisis, we were very much aware that primary healthcare is 
the part of the system where if investing appropriately, we can assure some sustainability of our system. So uh, I would ask you to move to the second, fly, uh, uh, second slide and then maybe come back to, to this one. So uh, the, as I said, we um, were at political level deciding that we are going to strengthen our primary healthcare system. And this has uh, very much to do what Ilana has said before that political decision is really important. Uh, um, what has happened actually that um, uh, at the same time, uh, a lot of evidence was brought uh, also by Observatory of Health Systems, if I may say so, we all remember the publications of David McDyde that prevention and health promotion do matter and that we can uh, be more effective in health sector if we invest also in these activities. So when strengthening primary health care, we were already discussing how to better integrate primary health care with uh, public health intervention. This was one of the aims of the reform. And also we were um, discussing because in Slovenia, equity in health is a really important value. We were also discussing how to better get to vulnerable groups, understand their needs, and then also, of course, uh, develop programs that uh, would be based in the community and through which we could access those uh, groups of population. Uh, then again, uh, we also understood that for this to happen, we need to build competent workforce and accessible facilities so that they would actually be uh, uh, in the community and uh, close to where people live and work. So this, uh, if we go back now to the first slide, if I may ask back, yes, here. This was for us, it was not such a big challenge since we already had a very strong primary uh, healthcare um, uh, uh, centers in place um, in all parts of Slovenia. And this was traditionally, uh, uh, we had uh, some of them are almost 100 years old. I mean, primary healthcare has a very long tradition in Slovenia. At the same time, we have strong public health uh, also and public health institutions in Slovenia. So uh, we had, in a way, we had capacities to build on. We started more or less um, with a mix of skills at the primary level uh, existing uh, from family physicians to pediatricians. Uh, and we already had uh, since uh, early 2000, uh, a kind of educational centers in place. Uh, uh, some success and uh, data proved it, we had with, for example, cancer screening programs, which are also based in primary health care. So um, here are two of them. It's the can uh, breast cancer preventive service and the colon cancer prevent uh, screening um, service. But uh, gynecologists also have a cervical uh, cancer um, uh, screening program in place. And as I said, gynecology is also at the primary level, which means without uh, referral. So if we now go to the, to, the, uh, to the last slide, thank you very much. Here you see that uh, we, uh, during our reform, we have actually focused on health promotion and preventive activities in local community. How did we do this? We have upgraded our preventive checkups uh, and we have introduced also the individual uh, to take, uh, to care about patients at the individual level, uh, additional um, uh, registered nurse as part of the family physician's team. And she was responsible for preventive services, but also for navigating patients through the system and also for taking care of chronic patients and monitoring them. So uh, this was one thing we did. The second thing we did, we actually in, uh, established uh, upgraded uh, health education center now called health promotion centers and the key here was that we wanted them to work together with other stakeholders in the community so to establish close links with social services 
NGOs that are uh, actually supporting uh, different groups of population, uh, and also with, uh, for example, schools and local local community as such. So this was another thing that has been done, and then we have also. Um, um, uh, establish screening for high risk individuals and providing health counseling and support programs. And here I can say that we maybe have at the beginning not considered mental health as important. It was there, but I will talk later uh, when we will discuss the consequences of COVID crisis, how actually we approach mental health because mental health uh, is something as we already knew during the reform uh, that uh, needs to be very close to people, community-based. There need to be services to support people, not just when they are uh, already diseased, but also when they are in difficulties and uh, need some support and help. And, and best uh, help actually can be offered in primary health care if, of course, primary health care is connected to other services in the community that uh, can support people when, when in need. So um, for the, just to conclude, for, using, for being able to do all of this, we have used uh, uh, a lot of uh, international support. Uh, we, we used um, uh, mechanisms, financial mechanisms to support our reform and to pilot different solutions. For example, Norwegian mechanism was used uh, early at, the, uh, at its early stage. And then uh, later we used uh, cohesion funding, European cohesion funding uh, to upgrade our health promotion centers and uh, to, um, uh, to uh, it, it, they are used now also and will be used to uh, support uh, the strengthening of mental health centers in primary health care. Uh, I may say that what uh, Austria is planning to spend, uh, we have uh, spent at least half of it already. So yes, it's costly, but we can already now from the data arising from statistics uh, on uh, cardiovascular diseases and also cancers show uh, that uh, we are on the right track. And I'll finish here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vesna, also for uh, reminding us of uh, specific dimensions that are really, really important uh, in primary healthcare. You mentioned the, the changed role of nurses um, in Slovenia or the new role for nurses I think this is quite quite important to take with us into the to the panel discussions. We may be more inclined to think about infrastructures, but it's the workforce is a really, really important component. We also heard that um, earlier uh, this month in our first round of discussions from the WHO regional director Hans Kluger, the importance of investing in the workforce and mental health. As we say, we just take this with us for the for the discussion further down the line. Also very important in, in Vesna's uh, presentation, again, this multitude of different avenues for implementing innovation, for example, your collaboration with uh, Norway, but also the, the cohesion funding um, to, support, to support transformation. So I think, again, uh, we see that no one can do it on their own, uh, but we pick up on this, on this topic uh, later in the session. I think we move. I don't see any questions in the q and It hasn't lit up here for me, so I'm not going back to Florian. I'm going to Thomas. Thomas, you're going to talk to us about primary healthcare reform in Flanders in Belgium. Um, over to you directly. Hello, everybody. I'm pleased to be with you. You may skip this slide. OK. Uh, I'm going to talk how the reform of the primary care in Flanders boosted the collaboration in the COVID-19 crisis. Yes, next slide, please. For those who have seen our little uh, video, here is the catch-up of it. In the July uh, 2020, Flanders was divided in 60 primary care zones. Uh, there was a population of uh, 75,000 to 125,000 inhabitants per uh, primary care zones and uh, per primary care zone and we installed a governing body, he body head of boards of the primary care zones. Those primary care zones are supported by the Flemish Institute of uh, Primary Care. Yes, next slide. 
We started our reform in 2010 and we ended it uh, maybe somewhere in the future. Uh, but at 2020, uh, the primary care zone started uh, uh, at full force with the COVID crisis and they have uh, taken up a role in the vaccination campaign uh, and the population management. Yes, next slide. At this moment, we have uh, vaccinated up to 90% of the 80 plus, and that it's due to the uh, primary care zones and uh, uh, local collaboration that we facilitated uh, from the Flanders uh, government. Yes. How do we do it? Huh? We uh, made a sustainable approach for increasing the vaccine, uh, vaccine uptake for social vulnerable people. Uh, those 60 zones with their different populations, uh, we could say that in one size doesn't fit all. Huh? The local invo involvement huh, uh, was very important uh, to make a local customization. Every primary care zone made their own way to reach the social, socially vulnerable people, huh? uh, they made a, they find they they uh, they made up a strategy to find them, to locate them, to gain confidence. How they uh, they thought about how to realize impact and uh, also to be proactive. Uh, this system could be a roadmap for a generic approach for infectious threats for the future. Yes. You may give a few clicks, uh, let's say five. Yeah. yeah, and another one, and another one. Okay, so how did we do it? Uh, every uh, primary care zone has a population manager and the population manager has uh, the, the person who was uh, searching for the under vaccinated people. Yeah? And uh, he how he did it, he was mapping and talking to the stakeholders and trusted uh, third persons. And the network uh, was very important. He built it up at the local level. He was really the spider in the web to connect all those different uh, stakeholders. You may give a few clicks. Yep, another one. Yep, another one. Another one. And another one. Okay, how did we embed it? Well, in the primary care zone, there was uh, there are four clusters. There is a cluster uh, healthcare in the board, a cluster of social and, uh, welfare, a cluster uh, with representatives of the patients, and a cluster of the local authorities. It is that combination eh, that made uh, the more call together and uh, defining the goals and, and also anticipating on the challenges of the vaccination campaign. Yes. Now you may give a few clicks to the next slide. Okay, how did they uh, work together? Well, first of all, we installed, and that's quite important, uh, we, we focused on giving them some data, data from the uh, Flemish uh, government, uh, uh, and also data uh, that it was reached from or, or gained from the uh, primary health records of the GPs. And to give them some data, uh, uh, they could adjust their strategy and motivate their strategy to the local authorities and all the stakeholders to uh, make their vaccination campaign. And we gave them some uh, dashboards and that was also connected the two levels of data on the uh, Flanders level and also from the GP level. It was quite a test. In Flanders, there are 5,000 GPs and 1,200 have participated to uh, connect the data. And we represented them, to, we gave them or visualized the data at sector level uh, of uh, our cities and communities. Yes, next slide. This is one way to present the data. Eh? Uh, you see on the slide, we may use the box plots eh? and the 65 plus vaccinated and the little star is for a region at uh, uh, the end and uh, that has vaccinated a lot of 65 plus, but uh, the visualization make it possible for the population managers to see the, uh, the deficits in the vaccination campaign. Eh? 
uh, the minus 44 had a loss through, there was in this sector a little bit work to do. Yes. And another click. Another visualization that we gave them was also with the uh, morbidity, so the comorbidity. So the first line was the cancer patients that were vaccinated, and you could see that this uh, sector has uh, done very well. Uh, but also, as you can see, the the the, the visualization for the neurologic diseases. So the third line that you see that uh, there was a little bit of effort that has to be done, and I. Uh, to give the uh, the primary care zones and the population man, population managers that kind of data, they could focus on different target groups and also reach out to get them vaccinated. Yes, you may give a few clicks. Okay. Uh, we also connected it with social uh, data and uh, economic status, and we also made some uh, mapping for it. Yes. And the last part we did, the last click, I suppose, is that we also made some uh, mapping to uh, reach out for the uptake of the second dose of the vaccination strategy. So we could also uh, reach out for the people who uh, didn't uh, like their second dose and to uh, make to motivate them to come to the vaccination centers uh, for the second dose. Those motivation and uh, strategy and this prevention strategy and sensibilization strategy was worked out at the, at the level of the primary care zones in close collaboration with the local authorities and all the, the care actors. Yes, I think that I'm at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. I think uh, what uh, what we saw is uh, is a very clear case in favor of uh, of a strong integrated uh, primary care approach that is close to the community. As also previous speakers highlighted, uh, the importance the importance of that. But also, um, I think the the crucial role of good health information systems, right? The, you did quite a bit uh, with uh, with data, um, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of uh, attention has been put on the digital transformation of healthcare. Sometimes focusing on the way it influences the provision of services, but also for for this type of uh, this type of element of implementing uh, reform and actually br bringing it forward. It seems to me that uh, for your uh, success. Um, in Flanders, this link to strong data that you could also share with, with your with your population was uh, quite important. Um, if we have time later on, I think we would we would uh, probably be very interested to know what primary care looked like before the reform, and especially this idea uh, of uh, of integration. But I think. For now, um, let's zoom in a little bit on the effects of the pandemic. I, I see, I saw there was a, a question in the Q&A, but it's rather for the panel later on, so I'm keeping it for that. I'm not going to the, to the Q&A now. Um, let's let's uh, reflect a little bit um, on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think for all your three countries, uh, the pandemic hit while the reform was ongoing. Um, and so the question is, what were the effects uh, for your health systems, perhaps, but also con concretely uh, on the reforms? We heard a little bit from Ilana about the delay in establishing new primary care units because different priorities needed to be set, but I'm sure there is a range of, of different things to, to think about. So Ilana, maybe we come first to you uh, briefly on, on the effect of the pandemic. It's a prerequisite for understanding how we can move on forward um, after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Timmy. I think really that we were confirmed in our approach that we need to strengthen primary health care during this pandemic. We saw that the primary health care units uh, in their structure, which is team based and also the sheer size of, of these units, they were really crisis resistant and resilient. They were able to keep up their work, they were able to keep taking care of their patients, and they were able also to separate uh, patients and and those patients that might be you know like infected and had to see the doctor so um, this was really something that basically encouraged us to, to further uh, go the same path and also in in uh, requesting the support within the recovery and resilience facility that I mentioned with this new project starting this year 
we put all our efforts really to, to write a good project outline um, in order to earmark these 100 million euros for strengthening primary health care. So that is, for me, uh, the most important uh, outcome uh, in regards to primary health care, really. Thank you. Highlights also linking back to what Thomas was talking about, the importance of uh, healthcare that is close to the community, quite clearly in, in, in these um, uh, unstable, unsure, difficult times uh, during the pandemic. Vesna, uh, we come to you. Uh, and I think you mentioned something about mental health. Um, I did, but I'll start with that uh, having a strong primary health care, which we at the time of crisis already, uh, I, I think we had, uh, we were able to very quickly um, develop a dual track approach. Uh, we were also able to use uh, some of the staff that was working in preventive centers uh, to, to deal with testing and uh, vaccination and so, but this is not advised to keep too long because prevention really matters. So we are going, uh, uh, we are actually eager now to, to um, full, uh, fully um, uh, also have in place preventive services. Uh, so not to make uh, a COVID epidemic uh, too much affecting preventive services any longer. Uh, but yes, what happened was that we realized how fast we can adapt our system. Something that was impossible a couple of years ago or before COVID became possible. And there are two things I would mention. One is digitalization. We'll, it's not just that IT support uh, was developed, it was already there, but people didn't use it as much as they did during the epidemic. So we started to use all these technical possibilities, telemedicine and so on, really quickly. And this is an advantage, actually. <laughs> Uh, and uh, also patients learn that they can communicate through, through emails and so on with the, the doctors uh, to certain, of course, level. But one thing that really happened was we realized how important is mental health support because uh, the, the crisis brought up a lot of uh, uh, need, much bigger needs of population in mental health services and support. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually we have during the crisis invested in um, bringing more uh, uh, clinical psychologists into the primary healthcare centers uh, and uh, actually improving uh, and uh, speed up uh, their creation in all, uh, all parts of Slovenia uh, because of the need that was uh, so much bigger during epidemic. And when we did so, we realized that the need was there already before. It, we just didn't realize that. So opening centers meant that uh, uh, in a second, they, all the, uh, uh, faci not facilities, but all uh, possible uh, services uh, were uh, occupied already. So the, uh, people started to queue already, you know. So this is because there is such a need in population nowadays for mental health support, not just for those, as I said before, that are already diseased, but for general people who have uh, uh, problems and they are related with mental health. Thank you very much, uh, Vesna, really a, a crucial issue uh, and a, a very good example of how the pandemic essentially laid all the structural problems and the unmet needs bare, even if they were not directly related to the, to the pathogen itself. Mental health, of course, is a particular area with uh, all the different components that you, that you already mentioned, but good to hear that there is a, this increased effort and I think very important point to take with us into the panel discussion for the second part of ensuring that mental health is part of these new, uh, new approaches into the, into the future. Um, there is a, a, a factual question for Slovenia um, in the Q&A, uh, but I think we can uh, ask our colleagues in Slovenia who are in the, in the panel, uh, in the audience, to maybe uh, comment um, in the chat function with the, your guidelines about GP visits. I'm not going to ask you that, Vesna, right now. Um, I am going to go to Thomas as our last uh, country uh, representative here on the panel uh, with the same question about the, the effects of COVID-19 inherent in your presentation. Thomas, but I'm sure there is more reflections there. Yes, uh, sure there are. Huh? 
I think the the COVID nineteen crisis kick started uh, sixty little companies, and we managed to uh, to get them started. Uh, that uh, uh, was quite an, a prestation. Uh, the most challenging. Uh, uh, I think for the future is defining common goals uh, and making the bridge between the local policy and uh, uh, the Flemish policy uh, and to uh, to make those uh, primary care zones more visible and to let them show their val value to the local authorities to uh, to boost them for the future. Uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, the common enemy, enemy showed that working together and the collaboration is possible, but there is a risk of uh, of that it will be diminished uh, future on. Data is key, as you mentioned, Dimitra. Uh, it's quite important uh, for us. Uh, we build it up very, very quickly, but uh, to consolidate it, it uh, the, the presentation of data is uh, the challenge for the future. That are the two main uh, reflections that I have on this moment. Thank you, Thomas. And also a very important point we heard from Ilana and Vesna about the importance of political will, but here also very clearly important the collaboration between different levels of uh, policy making and striking the balance between the level that is closer to the community and has the direct link uh, to the population and perhaps those with a more uh, macro view on things. And I think we we will discuss this a little bit more in the panel, but we go to the even more macro uh, perspective now. Um, we go to the European Commission um, and to Christoph Schwietz from DG Reform. Christoph, I think for you, the most important uh, points, most important perhaps not, but the first points that we would like to hear are related to your experience with uh, supporting uh, member states in implementing uh, innovation and implementing reform and how we can move that into the future. Christoph, over to you. Thank you. Morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, well, let me start by saying that uh, I'm looking optimistically into the future. And why is that? I think we never had uh, the opportunity to tap into so much support, into so many funds from the EU to support health system transformation. So that's great, but that also means there is a challenge because now we need to make best use of all those funds and the tools that are available. And based on my experience, this is not easy. Now, in the, in the past five years, I had the opportunity to look into and to support various uh, national administrations and regional administrations in more or less 140 reforms with the team here in DG Reform, working closely also with other DGs, uh, in the European Commission. And all the stories are very, very different. Just to give you a bit of an uh, example uh, of what we do, I mean, we work uh, on primary care transformation with Austria, uh, with uh, Stefan and Ilana very, very concretely here, but also with Spain, Portugal and Hungary. And of course, the way the expectations and the way you can work with Spain and Portugal and Hungary and Austria, this will always be different. The challenges will be different. So we need to be really tailor-made. We need to listen into the member states, what they really need, without preconceived ideas and without off-the-shelf products for the solutions. And that takes, of course, a lot of time, but it's the only, I feel, approach uh, that is really, really useful for member states First, to get the results they want. Second, also to build the synergies um, across different member states. So we need to be tailor-made. And I believe what is also very good now that the Commission, the European Union, supports member states throughout the whole cycle of the reform. Uh, we cannot focus only, for example, on developing certain standards, EU standards. But we have also to go into the real implementation on the ground. We cannot do that alone. Brussels cannot do this alone, of course. From my experience, I see the key here is building synergies and partnerships across member states, across willing member states that are willing to share their experiences bilaterally or in a multi-country fashion. Just one uh, very concrete example. 
that I've been working on personally also for a couple of years now in Czechia, where the Czech Minister, Ministry of Health wants to establish a national e-health agency as basically the core agency for driving the digital transformation of the health system. That's very ambitious. It's very good. There is a lot of excellent thinking behind it. And uh, there is a lot of different instruments flowing into that. For example, we have the e-health network group that was developing, that is developing standards. We bring that work to Czechia. But we also work very closely here with Austria. Uh, Austria is the key partner in this transformation project, bringing the lessons from Austria uh, to Czechia very pragmatically. Not only from Austria, but also from Denmark and out of the EU with Israel, who we know they have some excellent lessons to bring to the EU. So we're trying to build those partnerships, becoming really uh, stronger, stronger together. That's the only way how we can, I believe, face the tremendous challenges and really uh, reap the tremendous opportunities that now exist in the in the coming years uh, in the EU. And uh, now, um, as I mentioned, we work also with Spain very soon on primary healthcare reform. And I'm really looking now at Thomas, Stefan, Ilana, and Vesna. And I do hope we can bring all of you. I know your time is scarce, and that is one of the key challenges, really. How can we make this scarce time even more efficiently and effectively used? But I'm looking at you, uh, and I see you're smiling, Stefan. That's great. So I hope we can get together and share share ideas how to help Spain also how to do this together. So the second key point I wanted to mention is synergies and multi-country work learning. We, we work, for example, with Belgium, Czechia, also Estonia, Croatia, Germany, Greece, Portugal, uh, and Slovenia on digital transformation of health systems. In Slovenia, we just kick-started an e-health strategy project uh, very ambitious, uh, of course, again, a story of its own as every, of every story. But though the stories are different, we have to bring the people together to make the best use of the resources available. One very important point uh, is the recovery and resilience plan. Uh, Vesna mentioned it and Stefan mentioned it also. There is money available for the transformation of primary healthcare systems through the recovery and resilience facility that in total measures 800 billion euro in current prices for all kinds of reforms and investments in the EU. <clears throat> now, I really do hope that, and here I see the role of the EU, that we can bring the best practices from one country to another and do the reforms even, you know, in an accompanying fashion together. Now that sounds, you know, easier than it is. <laughs> Why? Because it is not a scientific process. It's not enough to set up a working group, but you really need the engaged and the passionate people behind who are really willing to go this way together because it takes a bit of an effort. It takes a bit of a time, but I believe it pays off uh, in the end uh, for everyone, either if you are a learner in a project or you are a best practice, uh, a best practice example in the project. There are always opportunity to, opportunities to, um, to gain. So we have the recovery and resilience plan, plans, but we also have all the other EU funds uh, that have been to a big extent beefed up, not all of them, but many. We have the European Regional Development Fund, the European Social Fund Plus, our technical support instrument, which has also grown in, in size here in the G form, the EU for Health program, Horizon Europe, Digital Europe program, and Invest EU program. We can make best use of those only if we work out the way how to make best use out of those. Those we have a couple of examples mentioned, but I believe there is still room to further facilitate their implementation. And I would love to think uh, together with all the colleagues here and others how that could be how that could be done because we can do this only based on your experiences. Now um, <clears throat> we have launched a call for proposals here in DG reform. 
on the next round of support that member states can engage uh, with us. One of the key uh, one of the key things that we wanted to bring forward, and it was not self-evident really, if you do tailor-made support to member states, is to strengthen multi-country corporations, to develop flagships based on uh, hmm. member states' needs. For example, we brought forward a flagship that was uh, brought together in the community of practice, uh, and it was actually a colleague from Catalonia who said, let's work on digital skills for healthcare workers. And we see already uh, that there is quite a bit of demand from member states to go, to go into this. Again, the key will be to build a partnership that is useful for everyone, that is providing really tailor-made support. So we implement the reform that Stefan needs, that Vesna needs, that Thomas needs, and Ilana and other colleagues, but at the same time, build the synergies that always are there. So voila, this is the things I wanted to, uh, to stress. Uh, again, it's, uh, we have really excellent opportunities but we have to be very clever how to use them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph. This was uh, really illuminating. I, I focus on just a second on this uh, point that you raised that there is a lot of uh, support there, but using it is not easy. Um, and using it in a way that is effective and is sustainable is also uh, not easy. And I think just to also advertise uh, ourselves a little bit, we at the observatory recently under the leadership of the Slovenian presidency have carried out work mapping the available tools from, uh, the, from the European Union to member states uh, to support uh, innovation and healthcare reform. Um, and we find exactly, as you said, that there is a lot, a lot, a lot available, but the challenge is knowing that it is there um, and knowing how best to use it. And I think perhaps moving into the panel uh, now, like the, the final part uh, of our session, we can reflect on that, how we can harness all the lessons that we've learned from all the different examples that we heard, knowing which instruments are there to help us move forward into actually tangibly transforming that into sustainable, useful synergies for the future. If I may, I would like to start with Stefan. Um, Stefan, we haven't heard from you since the very beginning of the session. So perhaps you can you can kick us off in the panel discussion by reflecting on that. What are the really tangible lessons that we can take with us after all that we've heard, uh, how to move this forward, how to ensure that we work together uh, to strengthen our health systems and rise like the Phoenix? Thank you. And, and thanks for everyone for, for sharing also this uh, uh, country experience, because I think really um, we share all the challenges and maybe sometimes we focus too much on sharing the challenges, but not sharing the solutions. And uh, I guess that's the way forward, uh, particularly now uh, after or coming out of the of the crisis and, and, and if I may to rise like a phoenix then in the end, but I'm really um, a bit not concerned, but we will see very different times. Obviously, we saw there was a really stress test for the healthcare systems all over the world, and and the hit of the pandemic showed, and and mostly we knew it where we have weak points in a way, and where we need to work harder to make um, our um, health systems more resilient. And resilience, only the word is, was used also in the health form for so many years already, but we always had a problem in defining it sometimes. So when, when we uh, were looking for definitions of the word resilience that we all love to use, um, now we know it because now we, we experienced it and we experienced a, particularly where our system and uh, the healthcare and, and, and social care system is not so resilient and where we really need to um, work harder. And if we, if we start from, and I think it's always easier to start with a concrete um, field or uh, policy approach. And if we take primary healthcare, for example, there is so much evidence for so many years now, even more than, more than years, decades. But what we uh, sometimes or mostly um, struggle and, and what, where the real challenge then in the end lies is in the implementation. So really we, we know the what and, and the why, but uh, the question is the how, and particularly how can we avoid maybe also mistakes and, 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 and uh, processes that elsewhere were not um, too successful or, or um, uh, too quick. And therefore it's, it's so crucial and for us uh, in the primary healthcare reform 
we relied a lot on that. So we had uh, joint policy dialogues with other countries. We had a lot of interaction with uh, the European Commission, with WHO, with other institutions, and learning from each other and, and uh, looking into the synergies is, 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 uh, was key for us just to be quicker in, 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 in doing the implementation process or at least um, having all the documents right. And sometimes, and I think that's where I want to change them from the past to the, to the future, is we, we all know that from our daily work, it, a lot depends on timing. Luckily, um, also knowing what are the possibilities out there to really support um, policy processes that we have. And um, it's in particular for, for smaller countries um, and then smaller health ministries and, and, and the administration in general, it's, it's quite um, tough uh, to uh, really have a good overview of all the different supporting instruments. And, and Christoph pointed to some of them. And I really appreciate the cooperation with the um, um, SRSS or now the technical support instrument, because I think um, the, the focus on looking at the implementation is, the, is, is one of the really important ones. And I think we need to push that further. And that's why also some of, of, of the colleagues here in the, in the panel discussion, we, we, we share a, a vision in a way that we really want to um, use the experiences in, in the last years, in, in, in the last decades, and then find new ways of, of working together jointly with the European Commission. I think that's really, um, if, if not now, then I don't know when. And if we can uh, make sure that we um, initiate um, a support that is also guiding us through this uh, policy process in showing exactly where are the possible uh, supporting instruments, uh, funding instruments, and you pointed to the work um, in, in, the, in the context of the Slovenian presidency. And I think that's, that's gonna be key because we know we need to be fast uh, in a way because the pandemic showed us where we need to look at. We, we all used e-health and depended on e-health so much during the pandemic and we were lucky, not lucky, but we, were, uh, we had the basis right and most countries did. But then the, the, the implementation of uh, e-medication or other projects sometimes took a bit longer than expected. And if we can um, uh, have more speed in, and more dynamics in, in those uh, policy um, projects on, based on a good cooperation with the European Commission and, and other international institutions, but particularly also between member states, I think that um, can be a, a, a tool um, to use uh, all the possible um, uh, supporting instruments and, and supporting funds that are out there. And uh, then really making sure to use those um, very focused in a way that it's benefiting um, the, the people relying on, on a good uh, social and healthcare system. Thank you very much, Stefan. I think uh, a lot of very important points here, the importance of being fast, the uh, importance of having the collaboration platform um, in order to be able to learn fast from each other and the importance of building on existing partnerships, but also the finding of new ways uh, to work together based on what we've learned and ensuring that we actually enable this cross-country um, learning but also that we know what uh, instruments we can use along the way of healthcare system transformation for how we, from what to do and why we do it. You said we already know most of the time, uh, but how to actually do it, how to actually implement change. Thank you very much, Stefan. I, I, I will pass to Vesna because I think this is in very much the priorities of the Slovenian presidency currently uh, of the council. Vesna, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I was very carefully uh, um, listening to what uh, Christopher and Stefan have said, uh, and they both mentioned that we have innovation uh, and innovative solutions on our agenda of our presidency for strengthening and making our health systems re more resilient. Uh, but this has not arised from the COVID crisis. This was uh, on uh, 
our agenda for the presidency already before the crisis. Why, uh, why was it? Because we have, from the experience with working together, for example, with Austria in Italy, uh, realized how beneficial it is if you can listen to others and reflect your own solutions that you intend to implement or, or are implementing uh, in uh, the view of other countries that might have completely different systems. So here, of course, when we put this on the agenda, agenda of um, uh, presidency, we were completely aware of subsidiarity in health systems and so on. This is not what uh, we want to change in any way. Uh, we all have our health systems with long traditions. They are different, uh, but as uh, Stefan said, we have more or less the same challenges. So there's, there is a need of uh, changing and adapting and uh, how to do this best um, we are considering that working together, and especially because we have this opportunity of working together at EU level, uh, um, th there are other opportunities, of course, within the WHO, for example, but here actually we have so many supportive mechanisms that were mentioned for this collaboration, so we thought that would be a really a good idea to, to um, make our collaboration uh, working better in practice and to become a, a, a normal way of collaborating in health systems uh, among EU countries. And we were looking at different solutions. I, I heard very well what Christoph said, uh, we don't want another working group. And countries were very clear when we explained to them what we are after as Slovenia having presidency, they said no, new working group, you know, and this is actually what we are not after. We are after different opportunities such as this one. Can you see how important it was, or you don't, but I know how important it was to me, the information that was presented by Thomas to have a population manager. Uh, I, I have no time to look at all the countries all the time, but this information to me and how they did it is really uh, important because we do struggle uh, with uh, certain problems in vaccination and so on, and here might be a solution and this event for example is appropriate platform uh, where I got this information and there might be a lot of opportunities where countries could discuss uh, health systems innovation in health systems the needs of health systems and the population uh, regarding uh, what health systems offer and all this we could work on uh, together and make these opportunities a way of uh, working together and collaborating so this is is one thing. The other thing is that I also heard was, you know, that is not only about innovating in developing innovation is also about systematizing then um, uh, evaluation. And this has also to do with actually investing in primary health care. And while we are reforming our health systems, we have to invest appropriately and evidence-based. And here it's so important to collaborate and uh, to make sure that we have uh, uh, evaluated uh, good um, practices uh, just recently, I was at an event where I was told that good practice is something somebody knew, uh, thinks it's good, but how do we know? Well, good practice is not that somebody thinks is good. Good practice is something that has been rigorously evaluated for the uh, impacts, not only for the process, and then we can call it good practice. And that, that is another thing where we would want to work better within EU and really look to good practices in this regard so that they are roughly evaluated and then that for their impact. So, uh, so we, can, uh, we can be sure that these really are uh, uh, evidence-based good practices. And another thing that we uh, were discussing today is the workforce uh, in health um, sector. And when uh, Slovenia uh, actually was uh, performing all the reforms, we can clearly see that there is a lack of knowledge, uh, not of our medical professionals, our nurses and the doctors and uh, the clinical psychologists, but of those people that manage health system in terms of finance organizing and otherwise. And these uh, people and young professional in particular, they have really limited opportunities 
to generate knowledge. They come maybe from financing, they are maybe uh, educated as, uh, as uh, economists or uh, lawyers or whatever, you know, and they don't really understand health systems. So how to bring all this knowledge about specificities of health systems to these people, for them to understand better where they work, in what kind of environment. This, I think, is a challenge for the future also. And here we would like to work together with the Commission and other member states to enable within already existing, uh, existing opportunities, opportunities for these particular young people. Uh, look, at Gastein is uh, certainly uh, um, uh, space where they can, you know, uh, that brings together these kind of people also and uh, tries to help them with understanding better health system. But this is only one opportunity. And then we have, of course, observatory, summer school, and so on. There are opportunities, but how to better channel this and make it more visible, this is now for us a challenge. And uh, I will, I think I will stop here. Uh, I think I said it or, uh, more than necessary. So uh, yeah, this is what I wanted to share. Thank you, Bas. All very, very valuable. And I think we, we come back to you. We will have time um, again. I think I, I don't know where to start commenting because that was that was really uh, a lot of really important information. I think perhaps uh, to uh, for me to, to shine a light on some of the of the elements you highlighted, we have to make sure that we share practices. So in this thinking of how we can move forward, the point is to try and find or pinpoint or decide which of the of the avenues that we have that are not necessarily working groups would work best for an exchange that is dynamic and flexible and enables countries to identify other countries with a similar experience that might be useful um, in a way that also somehow includes this idea of evaluation. I think all of us in health policy know the plan, do, check, act cycle. That, you know, when you implement something new, we all, you also need to check that it actually works. And if it doesn't, adapt it. And so moving forward, I think that's not very important that you bring this in, this area, this notion uh, of evidence-based best practice. But I think linking to the title of the session, which has to do with governance, this last point that you pointed out, that we need to focus not only on, on the mindset of the clinical staff um, uh, in, our, in our health systems, but also in the staff that is actually in this policy-making arena that will be um, the ones driving forward this sort of exchange, this sort of policy change. And for that as well, we need to find the avenues. I think uh, all of that is really important for us to take away from the session. You pointed out the usefulness of the reform in Flanders for your thinking at the Slovenian Ministry of Health when it comes to the population manager. I think I go to Thomas now before coming to Christoph uh, for some first reflections, Thomas, on what you've heard and about the possibility of collaboration with other countries and with the Commission moving forward. Over to you. Thank you. I think it's very important to share ideas with each other. Eh? We learn a lot of them. Uh, but two thoughts. Eh? Vesna already mentioned it, and I can uh, no more agree with it, that we have to implement a way to, uh, to get the individual, individual caregiver in touch with the system thinking, with the reform process. And I think when they get in touch with each other, with other countries, with system thinking, uh, that we can advance more uh, faster than we do at, at this moment. Eh? Uh, we share a lot of ideas at the, at the meso and the macro level, but maybe we have to give them in touch. Another thing is um, I'm looking also for yes uh, tools that will guide us, help us, uh, for the implementation of uh, certain processes. I can refer to the Sirocco tool. Yeah? It's a very hands-on tool where uh, we can implement it. It's guided and also uh, supported by the EU. And it was very, very helpful. Our primary care boards will use that kind of tool to make them their self-evaluation in the future. Also, uh, our primary care uh, the, the Flemish Institute for Primary Care will use that tool. So that's one of the, 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 the things that uh, that's for me, I think for Flanders, very important. Uh, first, of course, sharing ideas with each other at, at, at the policy level, but also make the effective implementation and also helping us to implement it. 
Thank you very much, Thomas. And I think this is definitely part of the priorities that we've heard about. It's not about only the what and the why, it's about the how. And you mentioned one of the tools, but then again, depending on the context, depending on the specific uh, reform objective, it might be different tools. And I think, uh, again, there, the experience of implementing those tools themselves even is, is, really, is really helpful. So I think part of the exchange avenues that we are talking about now and part of the support that is available should definitely factor that, factor that in. Um, Ilana, I'll come uh, to you after uh, bringing in Christoph, uh, as I promised, perhaps for, for a short reflection. But first, um, Christoph, over to you. You've heard from our three uh, countries already uh, reflections also on what you talked about. Uh, what do you think? Thank you very much. Well, maybe just one reflection on, a, on implementation capacity, let's put it like that, because we are talking about a lot I hear about, you know, how can we bring these things on the ground? And uh, for example, uh, let me give a concrete example. In the Baltics, we support uh, hospital sector reforms, where you, where the ministries would like to uh, set, you know, a vision and maybe even a more pragmatic view on the way uh, hospital structure should be in future very politically sensitive, not only that, but also needs a lot of uh, implementation, right? In the end, it will be about the managers in the hospitals, it will be about the medical and non-medical staff uh, having to implement the consequences when you talk about merging a hospital, when you talk about changing the uh, function of a certain hospital. And what I find, you know, in this, uh, in this project, but also in many other projects, probably if I had to put a uh, percentage, you know, every second project has a has a challenge there is the implementation capacity uh, in the Ministry of Health, because the agendas are so big, there are not enough people, even if you have highly skilled people often, to implement all the reforms and to support all the stakeholders within, within, with the implementation. So sometimes what's lacking is, you know, it's just a project manager or a pro program manager office. And some of the things you need there, you know, is the skills that Vesna mentioned specifically for healthcare, but you need also some that are far less, let's say, interesting or sexy. You need someone who knows the procurement procedures. You, you need someone uh, who knows all the administrative procedures. And without that, you know, you cannot buy any, any IT, you cannot go and implement any change. So, um, so this is, you know, something where I believe, uh, First of all, we put a bit, quite a bit of focus. You know, we have a competitive procedure when selecting the projects that we are supporting member states with. And that's one of the key questions also. Do you have the capacity to work with us on the project and to implement the project on the ground? If not, you know, the chances that this will remain only a strategy paper are, are rather high. So <laughs> I believe here is a focus of, of future work, how to best improve the implementation capacity. And of course, that can be done through uh, cross-country learning, seeing which very pragmatic concepts work here, uh, even if your resources are scarce, that you can achieve uh, the goals uh, that you have. Thank you. I think this uh, resonates quite well with what Vesna was talking about, the necessity of training uh, those that are actually moving forward uh, with these agendas. My feeling is if a, if a member state comes to you and says, this is what we want to do or help us do this, and then you ask, do you have the capacity to implement? And the answer is no, then the project that you should be or would be working on is building the capacity to actually implement this type of project further down the line. I'm thinking, you know, this is something that we integrate maybe in our ideas for how to implement change in the future, that the co basic component part is ensuring that this type of um, these type of professionals are available uh, and can be also perhaps flexibly brought into different different projects. So I think, thank you very much for this. This is really important. Um, Ilana, I come to you perhaps for, a, for a, some thoughts from your experience from Austria, but also from our previous discussions on this, um, how, we, how we move this forward. I mean, I, from what I'm hearing from our colleagues so far, it seems like we want something more formal when it comes to finding the, the avenues for working together better that should not be the same type of the constellation that we already have, that maybe uh, hasn't worked as flexibly and dynamically in the past. I'm thinking of the working groups that you were talking about before. Uh, what are your thoughts? 
Well, I can only agree with that because uh, the, this, this word of working groups, that's something that was also in our development of the new project, uh, something that we really wanted to avoid. We didn't want to get back to this um, kind of old structures where we, uh, where we don't get into implementation really on this hands-on experience that now all the speakers mentioned. And also what um, Christoph just said about the implementation capacity, uh, I believe that's really um, a very important point because in the Austrian ministry, we are not that many people, as, uh, as you might imagine. We are a few people who are, who are writing this project. And so we are really thankful that we have on the one hand, the Public Health Institute in Austria, because without them, it would have been impossible really to, to write that project and to, to start really developing also all these uh, steps that are necessary uh, in, in project implementation. And uh, in, in regards to exactly that project with the Recovery and Resilience Facility, um, we really have a big team now working on different aspects because also the size of this project with 100 million is just really different to what we are used to. Um, and so we, we have to think about innovation also in, in direct implementation and we are trying to um, to in integrate also thoughts about change management. How do we integrate um, social innovation, all these aspects so that we can really guarantee sustainability in this project. So there are very new um, thoughts that we have to uh, consider and here also stakeholder involvement is so important as I mentioned before, because if, if there is not this ownership, then I, I don't think that we get uh, too far in the end. Yeah. Thank you, um, Ilana. I, uh, this is also really reflective of what we uh, heard in the very beginning, thinking back to the discussions that we had uh, earlier in September and what we heard also from the WHO, but also from our uh, panelists today and from the audience uh, in previous sessions, we would like to hear from the audience in this session. Now, there have been a couple of uh, a couple of comments um, in the in the chat, a couple of questions in the Q and A. Most of them were specific, so we didn't necessarily bring them up if they were factual. Uh, let's do it this way. While we before I go to you, Florian, to give us a little bit of a of a taste of what's been going on in the chat to activate our audience a little bit more um, and thank them in a way for being here uh, on Monday morning. We thought we'd like, we'd like to ask you to tell us after everything you've heard from all our uh, esteemed panelists on how to implement uh, collaboration and in innovation uh, better in the future. Um, give us your thoughts. This is a word cloud exercise uh, on what the most important enablers are to make our health systems fit for the future. We, we've heard quite a bit already um, and what the focus should be from here on out and how we harness the lessons from the pandemic, but we would also like to hear from you. Uh, there's more than a hundred uh, participants with us this morning. So um, while we wait for the, for the world cloud to generate, um, Florian, we haven't heard from you that much because the activity in, in the chat and in the Q&A was structured in a way that didn't necessarily uh, uh, mean that you had a lot to summarize, but perhaps now is a good point while we wait for our audience to engage. Otherwise, for you to tell us, uh, perhaps give us a summary of what's been going on. Florian, over to you. Sounds good, and, and thank you very much, Demi. Happy to, to give you a quick summary. So as you pointed out, there has been quite a bit of activity in the chat and in the Q&A forum already. So thanks to everyone who um, contributed to that. And there were a couple of country-specific questions, mostly to Vesna and Christoph, also that have been answered directly. And then there were a couple more questions for the wider group and the panel, so and something I, I think I'd like to bring in here now. And um, one question was more really uh, from coming from the health systems, the resilience perspective, asking um, on that macro level again that we touched upon earlier. So why weren't we, why weren't most health systems prepared for this um, challenge of COVID-19? And then looking forward uh, into the future, what can we improve now? Um, I'd actually like to combine this question a little bit with what we were talking about earlier and the 9th of September meeting and also some questions we derived from there. And, and there, for example, we had this question on, well, drawing from the COVID-19 experience, which are the ingredients that are now needed to build stronger, more health, um, more resilient health systems that are fit for the future? 
And then looking concretely into, into those ingredients again, how can member states work together and with the commission, of course, to reach such a goal of resilience? Very, very big questions there, of course, but uh, since we have so many experts around the table, I think we could touch upon those now as well. Um, and then the second um, very interesting question I think that came in from, from Sara was actually on the role of the industry that we haven't really looked at, at it uh, yet so much. And she was asking, well, where do we see the industry's role, the industry's job in, in partnering to making primary healthcare more innovative and efficient? And then specifically, um, what is the relation there and the opinion on value-based healthcare? So some food for thought here coming out of the, the Q&A forum and the chat. And, and thanks again to everyone who, who put in there. Thank you, Florian, for the summary. Indeed, a lot of uh, a lot of different points that we could pick up on. Um, I see we have about thirty people who have already participated in the word cloud. I can only encourage the the rest of you to do so as well. Um, okay, so I take away, uh, Florian, the these two issues of main ingredients for moving forward. Uh, after the pandemic, we've dis been discussing this now for almost an hour and a half. Um, and some of them we already see, I think, in, in the word cloud, if main ingredients is synonymous to the most important enablers, and we, are, we have collaboration very clearly in the middle, um, chimes well with what the panel has been talking about. But I think this idea of synergies and partnerships that all of our panelists brought forward uh, Mostly we talked about exchange between member states and indeed the role of the industry has not been highlighted yet. So perhaps um, this is a, a, nice, uh, a nice element to include. In the final remarks uh, from each of our, our panelists, we have five minutes left um, in our session and unfortunately we cannot be late uh, in wrapping up. So what I would like to do is to reflect back to our uh, four panelists, uh, because Stefan unfortunately had to had to leave on an urgent Ministry of Health uh, matter. Um, this last idea, basically, we've heard quite a bit about what we want and what we need to collaborate differently, to collaborate better, to collaborate more in the future. Perhaps to finish and to wrap up, for each of you, the main three uh, ingredients to make this work. And if you want to reflect in the role, on the role of public-private partnerships or the role of the industry in that, that would also be, I think, quite welcome for our audience. In terms of sequencing, I think I will start with Vesna, go over to Thomas, Ilana, over to you, and end with uh, Christoph for a final word. Vesna. Thank you very much. I think I already mentioned uh, all the necessary ingredients to uh, get forward. They are also, we are also aiming at these ingredients during our presidency. I hope we will um, have some good uh, council conclusions in this regard. But there is one thing that uh, uh, was mentioned by Ilana and also in the chat, how important it is to get people that actually perform primary health care on board early uh, and have them there uh, in a decision making. And this is also what we have learned in Slovenia. So you can never do something for others if they are not included. Uh, if we want to act appropriately in primary health care, we have to have in bo on board already from the start, already when innovating, already when making uh, decisions uh, about primary health care, those people that work there, but never forget the patients. Thank you very much, uh, uh, industry, Vesna. Sorry, industry is also important, but here, <laughs> here I would say that uh, we should be more specific because industry is industry. And we, uh, when we are speaking, for example, of preventive uh, services and prevention in general and health promotion, we know exactly how to deal with different industries. I don't know which industry was mentioned here, uh, if it is uh, uh, IT support industry, for example, yes, we have to work together and innovate because in technical aspects, we cannot do without them, but they also have, as I said before, to understand specifics of uh, IT support in health systems. And this is not so easy. So they are also the ones that should maybe get more information how health system actually work to find more appropriate solutions. 
Thank you, Vesna. There was, it wasn't specific to an industry, but I think this point of ensuring uh, the adequate skills for understanding health systems and health service deliveries is really important. Uh, we come back to this issue of probably private partnerships, perhaps in a different session, we would need an entire one and a half hour to discuss it, I think, um, in, a, in an appropriate manner. Thomas, over to you sure. for final thoughts. Thank you. I've written three things down. Huh? Uh, Christoph uh, made me think about it. Uh, the capacity building at my level is very important and how to and how can we reach it. I think that's uh, the, 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 main, the main topic that I take uh, away at home. Involving stakeholders and caregiving givers and uh, uh, systems to do that and to get them in touch uh, between member states, I think it's very important. That's also one of the things I'm uh, taking home. And then also the bridging policies. Uh, it isn't talked a lot about here between the different levels. Uh, that's also uh, something that I uh, will note down to work on in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I think this is the different levels uh, and really important point. You brought it up earlier. Uh, we heard about it a little bit, but not a lot. You're absolutely right. Ilan, over to you. Well, I think that uh, an important part is this new ways of cooperation here. Also, the cooperation with the European Union and Commission is obviously central, but it's also about um, introducing innovation already in this planning process. We really start to think outside of the box. We need new types of cooperation. and. Um, and while doing that, we need to do multitasking. I mean, you need to be pragmatic, but you have to act fast. At the same time, you need to really consider all aspects that are relevant, and this is really challenging. So to be prepared uh, is, is important. And lastly, I think the trust um, is really, really central here because uh, that is directly linked again to ownership and, and um, sharing a vision and, and sharing a goal with the most important stakeholders and decision makers. Exactly. I think involving stakeholders from very early on, uh, even in the conception of ideas as you plan to do with your incubator is key for, for fostering trust and for actually enabling innovation. Uh, thank you, Ilana. Christoph, last but not least, over thank to you. you. Really looking from the top, I mean, there has never been a stronger case for a European health union. Okay, We, we have a stronger health security framework you will be better able to respond to future crises through our new agency, HERA agency. But I hear here also really the eagerness from everyone, because we've been going through this together through this crisis, to build things together. And we have the instruments, in particular with the recovery and resilience facility, also with DG reforms, technical support instrument, and other funds to do this together. And uh, the third point would be let's be pragmatic and solution-oriented in that voyage. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph. This is about building on existing uh, st structures for uh, collaboration and support, but also thinking about new ways uh, of collaboration. I think we've heard from, from all of you the same. I think uh, we would like to hear also from our session particip participants, from forum participants, if you have, as Christoph said, pragmatic, tangible ways that you think Countries can work better together or can work better also um, with the collaboration of the Commission. Reach out to us, gladly to me at the observatory via the European Health Forum Gastein with your ideas and we'll pick them up uh, for, for future work and future discussions. I think we heard uh, quite a, a solid reflection of the discussions that, we, that we've been having previously and also see that um, in the audience participation we need. Uh, to find new ways or build on uh, new ways to collaborate. Uh, we have to do it together, as we heard, um, and involving stakeholders, including the patients. Thank you very much for bringing this up, Vesna. From very early on and along the process of change until implementation of innovation is really important. And learning from each other and evaluated best practices is key in that respect. Just as a very brief summary of all the very interesting elements that we've heard, at this point, I would like to thank all of our panelists for their really important insights from their country perspectives, also from the European perspective, and all of you for joining us. Uh, please reach out with your ideas and solutions and we will see you at other sessions throughout the week and also hopefully next year live in Gastein. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Goodbye.